So, hello everyone, my name is Bernardo Sim and I'm a writer for Out Magazine. Today I'll be speaking with Sasha Valore about her new book, The Big Reveal, so let's get started. Uh, Sasha, this is a very insightful book filled with information not only about your personal history as a drag performer, but also about the history of drag as an art form. During the writing process, did you want to approach this more from a personal standpoint, a more general perspective, or was a combination of those two always the main idea? I always dreamed of writing some combination of the two. It's kind of my fantasy of what a queer history should be like. Like it's, there's no official story of drag. So we have to talk about like how we pieced it together, how I did my research, why I'm connecting certain things and drawing the line about others. Um, I felt like I couldn't tell a history without my personal story, but I also couldn't tell my personal story as a drag artist without shouting out this incredible history that's there. The revolutionaries who came before and made it possible to be so open about being queer, about doing drag, the amazing artists who've already invented everything. So we're all just recycling their ideas and hopefully exciting new combinations. So it was that was always my intention. And I wanted to add art too, to make it that bizarre combination of memoir and history quilted together in visuals too. Yeah, there are a lot of incredible pictures in the book, but one that really tickled me was a beautiful baby Sasha dressed as the Wicked Witch of the West for Halloween 1991. Uh, you reference your obsession with witches and vampires a few times in the book. How did these archetypes shape you as an artist? Um, okay, I think... I mean, I do think queer people gravitate towards these villainous characters, possibly because the villainous characters are already kind of queer coded <laughs> people, you know, but we can still identify with something maybe meant to suggest there's something scary about being between or outside of gender or beyond heteronormative sexualities. I love that we still identify with these characters and are like, let me find the redeeming qualities of the witch. Like, she may be terrorizing the villagers, but she's so fabulous. She has ambitions. She has desires like the rest of us. Um, but shoulder of course, pads. it's a little tongue-in-cheek. Yeah, she has shoulder pads. She has <laughs> hair tendrils. Oh, my fake brooch just fell off. Um, <laughs> the earring from the cover of my book I'm trying to wear is a brooch today. Um, but those became my first like drag acts, getting to dress up as the characters that I loved in popular entertainment and I I recognize now that that was me trying to connect with this larger community with people who were strange but still beautiful um who were outsiders yeah, absolutely um in chapter one ritual you talk about the history of drag and how it's become attached to queerness uh, what's your take on the anti-drag and anti-queerness narrative that we are unfortunately currently experiencing in comparison to this long history that you revisited in the book. Right. I mean, that's the thing. There's the crisis around gender, around trans existence, around drag is completely manufactured and made up. Conservative politicians and journalists have been trying to suggest for that's the real tradition. The real common thread is people making up this idea that something new is happening, that things are shifting, that there's tons more queer expression. It's always been there. Trans people are real. Drag is part of culture, part of art. So it, it need, we need to make room for it, not find ways of closing down on it. I think yeah. in most cases, the anti-drag laws are a way of legislating against queer expression. Are It's connected to the anti-trans bills. So it's why the drag community really needs to rally against the trans community, rally with the trans community against all of the anti-medical legislation, all the fear mongering about what's happening to young people. Um, we're fighting for existence and visibility of our entire community. I guess the hope, I want people to have some hope. And I feel like the history of drag, the history of the queer community has a lot of hope built into it. Because like I said, this isn't the first time we've faced fear. But 
even under the most oppressive times when it's been illegal to be visibly gay on the street, we've still found ways to be ourselves. We've still found ways to form community, to share resources, to raise money, to find, to employ each other and keep ourselves fed and housed and taken care of. So I think, you know, it is pretty dire, but there's still room for hope. And there's a tradition of resistance that we just have to continue. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, uh, how how long did it take you to finish this book? How long was your writing process for this book? I can uh, only imagine, but but do you do you have a ballpark? Oh God. Yes. It took me it took me three years, I would say. Three years. Yeah. Um, so it's really interesting that the book is coming out. This book specifically, your book, is coming out right now with everything that is going on. Because I think it really shines a light on exactly what you were saying that, you know, throughout history, people have been trying to do exactly what they're doing right now. Um, and for this book to come out right now, especially, I think gives us pause to think about everything that we've already overcome and um, to also realize that there's some hope, I guess, like you said, that, you know, if we overcame all those other periods in history, we can overcome this one too. That's right. I wasn't trying to convince people with the book, but as each kind of new wrinkle in this current manufactured anti-drag, anti-trans crisis came about, I kept trying to adjust my argument a little bit to to maybe speak to people who don't, who aren't, you know, just like me. I'm, I'm lucky I'm in a community of people who love drag, who understand yeah. that it's art, who believe that trans people deserve every equal right and opportunity. But this book needed to be able to speak to an even broader audience. So absolutely. Sometimes a little yeah. hate can fuel some inspiration. <laughs> so I tried to channel it into writing, writing what I believe in. Absolutely. Um, as someone who is both a drag performer and someone that hosts the nightgowns um presentations and performances, um, what is your take on the current, you know? Um, it's a hard question to ask, but uh, uh, the current state of security that you feel as a drag performer with, you know, we, we, we recently had, you know, a shooting case um, where drag performers were in the club. And um, how, how do you feel as a, both a drag performer and as a business person who is putting together these performances? Have you been hiring extra security? Um, what has been your approach to this whole situation? That's a really interesting question. It is such an important part like a producer's job is so much more than the really fun creative thing <laughs> of yeah. working with the right um with the right venue that provides security and and staff that will take care of us um i think we have a really good home right now for nightgowns at la poisson rouge um it feels safe being in new york city i guess that's kind of an advantage of living here there's such a tradition of drag i, I feel you know, mostly, especially when I'm out with other people, I feel like we're protected on the street together um, and that we can still be ourselves. So I'm just going to keep trying to do my due diligence. There's always new things to worry about. That's like the real, <laughs> the blessing and the curse of being a producer is it's it's never a finished job. And there's always new things to learn. So just keep adjusting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, in recent years, drag artists, um, queer artists, um, LGBTQ movies and TV shows as a whole have been more embraced by mainstream media. What are your thoughts on this, on this changing landscape for LGBTQ performers and content that we're now seeing with rom-coms opening in theaters and, you know, Angela was just in Dancing with the Stars. You know? yes. <laughs> we just keep, you know, pushing uh, forward. What are your thoughts on this current landscape of more diversity? It's interesting because I do think what people get exposed to on TV changes their understanding of the world. So I'm grateful to the the strides that were made by gay and queer people on TV when I was a kid, like Will and Grace and Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. You know, now now we look back and have plenty of notes for those platforms, but at the time it like it absolutely revolutionized what I thought would be possible and gave me hope for what a gay adulthood could be like. So I think it's amazing. 
I know we still got to convince some people. I feel lucky to be on the forefront of some so much action. Like um, I got to produce the, the Nightgowns TV show with it was first for Quibi. Now it's on the Roku channel. Um, and in that process, I got to peek even more behind the scenes when I when I tour my show Smoke and Mirrors. And each time we get in the room, drag artists are surprising the people who hold institutional power in the arts and entertainment as to what we're capable of. Like what are how entertaining our shows can be, how many people are interested in what we have to offer. And like we just I guess we're we got to keep surprising them over and over again until the lesson is learned that they, this is part of culture and we have something to say and we're good at putting on a show. <laughs> so give us a Absolutely. stage. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think a lot of this modern day drive that we're experiencing through Drag Race, through, through Dragula, and through so many other platforms. Um, a lot of these performances can be credited to performers like Lipsenka, who you call your ultimate New York City drag inspiration. Um, have you gotten to know her personally? What would you want the world to know about this drag legend that hasn't, I guess, been exposed in that mainstream um, way? I, I just love talking with Lipsinka. I've gotten to know her. We we brought her to Nightgowns, um, I think in 2017 or 2018, which was a huge accomplishment, I felt. Um, and and she's on the, uh, her pull quotes on the back cover of the book, <laughs> oh, which was really exciting. Um, she, she, I mean, he... John likes to go by he out of drag because there is okay. a generational difference um, yeah. between the artists of today and of yesterday. But I feel like we are so indebted to the that creative explosion, particularly of like the 90s in New York City, like the Pyramid Club scene, the Wigstock generation, artists like um, Lipsinka, Charles Bush, Kevin Aviance. Um, I'm not sure like that we're really that far advanced from <laughs> what they were doing. Uh, so it's it's amazing that these icons are still around and can give us some wisdom. Like watching Lip Sync a perform is just a masterclass in stage presence and the art of the lip sync. Um, people you, not so long ago underestimated whether lip syncing was an art in itself or whether it was like kind of a cheap trick. And I think People, artists like Lipsinka showed like you can use that format to do something that is its own kind of performance art. Drag can be more than singing or comedy. It can be this something really, really creative and put together. And I don't know. I I just love it. Yeah, I love it too. And I and I love how my guys keeps pushing what you can do through the art of lip sync. I think that is one of the most fascinating parts you know, incorporating uh, the imagery transposed yeah. onto the performer or onto your background. And, and it's very interesting that you keep pushing these creative ways to get past what they were doing in the 90s. <laughs> I think <laughs> it's really so. cool when you keep pushing that those right. boundaries. Uh, in this book, you provided a lot of details that I think will please Drag Race fans about how you pulled off your iconic rose petal review at the finale <laughs> of Drag Race Season 9. Gotta give a little um, something. <laughs> you gotta give a little something. Um, since then, a lot of finalists have tried to create their own versions of a lip sync reveal that could live up to the excitement built around your rose petal review. But many fans don't think anyone has achieved that level of, uh, of a reveal. Have you been watching these finale performances and do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I love the Drag Race finales. I kind of love, obviously, I, I guess I have to love that it comes down to a lip sync. <laughs> Still, <laughs> what you can do. Because I feel like what you can really surprise the audience with out of your own imagination is a great test of your artistry. Um, we're called, that, that's like real life. We have to take a little moment and use it to surprise people. Uh Hmm. I also feel like I was benefited by it hadn't happened before. So maybe people were expecting like a less, less prepared, more just like a classic lip sync for your life. But I had spent <laughs> days like trying to craft stories for these numbers. 
Um, actually, I did that with all the lip syncs for your life, just in case on my season. That's just how I approach it, I guess. I think the the secret is that it's not really about the reveals. You just use the reveals as a tool to tell a story. I think I've made this mistake myself, but sometimes it's tempting to build a number around a concept you have for what you can take off or what you can surprise people with. But it needs to be in service of a story. And I was I was trying to spill my heart there on the stage. And that you <laughs> did. That you did. That you did. Um, and I do think it's very interesting in the book that you do break it down. Um, how, you know, what it means to do a reveal and what's behind doing a reveal and how a reveal isn't always taking something off. It can be um, revealing an emotion, revealing something the audience doesn't know about you. Um, so I, want, I wonder, do you have any piece of advice to a drag performer who's trying to pull off a big reveal at, at a, let's say, a drag race finale? <laughs> Ooh, yeah. I mean, it's an opportunity. Every performance is an opportunity to tell the audience something. So I think if you don't know exactly what you want, what you want them to walk away with feeling or knowing, you need to like keep workshopping the idea. Um, you know, of course, we all want everyone to say, okay, she's the fiercest, most beautiful, fashionable one up there. That's just, <laughs> I think, part of being a performer on stage. But we can use these songs, these performances to, I think, reveal like a human side of us. The best performers reveal like an insecurity or an imperfect side of themselves through this highly perfected art form. And I think that strange contradiction is the magic of drag and what we keep turning up to the drag show to see. We want to get to know people through their drag, the real side. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the comic book strip that introduces the book jokes about you returning to reality TV to quote unquote <laughs> raise your profile. Um, and you seem like you're not interested um, in doing it. This is, I have to sneak in this question here, Sasha. Do you ever consider competing on Drag Race again as a real possibility? Absolutely. I mean, it is an incredible, it is not only a fun TV show, it is the currently the best platform for sharing drag with the world. And I um I've learned from the legends before me, you take pop culture as it is and you make it work for you. And that is what I did on Drag Race once before. I have been prepared the entire time <laughs> to go back and do it again. Um so would that be all, all winter season? Let's see. Let's see if they call me up. <laughs> all right, all right. Um my last question is I'm personally a huge fan of the world that you've created with nightgowns. I watched uh, the docuseries on Quibi. <laughs> then I watched it again on Roku TV. I've tried to purchase it outside of these streaming platforms, but I don't think they make it available for me to purchase them outside um, because I really love it. Um, that was my first exposure to like a HD uh, performance of Sasha Colby, who is currently slaying the game on season 15 exactly um have you already fulfilled all of your dreams and goals and nightgowns or is this a project that you want to keep expanding even further and if so what are your dreams and aspirations for this platform oh i love that question thank you bernardo i'm so glad that you've been watching and yeah working with sasha colby as i talk about in the book is like one of the highlights of nightgowns um and of my life <laughs> together um I feel like I did reach a huge dream, a huge goal in transforming it into this film series that showed on stage and off and could live on. I would love to do more of that, but I, uh, one dream I still haven't realized is being able to take this show on the road and tour all over the world with a traveling drag show of the highest quality made by and for drag performers ourselves. So Hopefully that's still in the cards. Um, and I kind of regrouped and and decided to start doing smaller shows that were, I mean, maybe a little easier for me to pull off and also show, got to show more numbers from the performers because I kind of missed 
the old days of nightgowns where everyone would do two or three numbers and we'd come up with a group number together. So that's the model that we just did. I, I know you shared the story of Meatball's incredible George Santos performance from like, God, four days ago. Yeah. So I feel like we're having big success with the current nightgowns and I, I hope this will lead to more video, more TV opportunities and taking it on the road as well. Yeah. Well, Sasha, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. This is an amazing book. Um, I got a copy from the publisher, but I already have pre-ordered the hardcover copy as well because I thank need you. the hardcover. Um, I'm so excited for what's to come. Um, and I wish you nothing but the best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bernardo. Yes, I hope everyone will pre-order there copy it looks even better in person yes <laughs> <laughs> thank you sasha have a wonderful day thank you